Reform or revolution? Can the fundamental reordering of society be brought about through gradual change legally within the current system, or through swift, extra-legal, and potentially violent action? It's no exaggeration to call this one of the defining questions of leftist political philosophy. Those who stand by the former method of reform have come to be known amongst Marxists by many names, but the one we'll use today is opportunists. Now, I want you to dispense with the negative connotations surrounding that name. Those who will be calling opportunists today are not cold, calculating villains hoping to seize the first chance to destroy any hope for a better world for their own personal benefit, at least not all of them. Uh, in theory, opportunism hopes to create a better world just the same as Marxism does, but focuses on methods that are immediate, obvious, and that are assumed to be more practical. However, this way of thinking remains deeply misguided, as it's based on a number of misconceptions about the state, history, and capitalism itself. Guiding us through these misconceptions, explaining why they're wrong, and providing us more philosophically robust alternatives will be Polish Marxist Rosa Luxemburg. This is We Read Theory. Welcome to We Read Theory, the podcast where we read theory so you don't have to. I'm Mark. And I'm Alex. And how you, you go. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> how have you been taking this last uh, week and a half or two weeks or whatever? Whenever was the socially acceptable point to start quarantining? Um, so it's been since Monday last week for me, since I've really, really uh, been outside. It's honestly not been too, too bad for me just yet. But um, honestly, the hardest. You haven't been outside. I mean, I've been outside, but I haven't like like I went to work last Monday, and it's been about eight days since I've done that. So, yes. Oh, shit. Um, how about you? I did a pretty much all day drinking event. Um, this Saturday before this previous Saturday, so it's been like a, a week and a half for me where I just haven't visited anyone um but been able to just stay inside with the girlfriend for extended period of time which doesn't happen very often because she does not live near me so this has been nice it's quarantine life is actually better than my life normally honestly so i've been working out i've arguably been more social i like talk to people like that i haven't talked to in months because <laughs> i have nothing better to do but um yeah that yeah, and I've seen a million people outside. Like every time I go, out, I do go outside on the rare occasion that I do need to. I see people outside walking and biking and shit like that. Like every time I've had to drive somewhere, there are no cars on the road. I know. Yeah, I saw like a bunch of kids outside my window. Like I might want to see that around where I live. But um, the uh, the hardest thing, honestly, or at least the worst thing about this whole uh, ordeal is that we have one good mic between the two of us, and it's at your apartment. And you aren't there, and I'm not there. And so our listeners are all having their ears graced by... I, ha I have a, um, a pair of Samsung headphones that are falling apart that have a microphone built into them. This is the best I could do. What, what, what kind of equipment are you rocking on your end? Yeah, I got the um, Apple Air 7s. Um, pretty solid. Uh, just standard stock white headphones. You honestly um, don't sound too bad, in my opinion. Um, so hopefully, hopefully it's not going to be too too bad. If you have gotten used to the just absolutely creamy, smooth audio quality that uh, we've come to be associated with in the past few episodes, then I'm truly sorry. But you know, we decided that this was uh, worth it to get out some episodes in the meantime because uh, you know, no one really knows how long this is actually going to be. So. Um, and by the way, it's not because um, it's not because of the tech that my voice sounds better. It's just the low gravelly sexiness of smoking a lot of American spirits. So, did you know anything about reform or revolution? You know, as a historical debate between leftist theorists before we kind of went into this episode, or was this kind of all new territory for you? Uh, no, not really. Just between. Um, 
uh, two friends in particular who I can think of. One is very much uh, a liberal and the other is very much a, we need to have a violent revolt now. So I just listened to them banter, which is, my most, which is where most of my exposure comes from. You know, it's actually a kind of a, an interesting point because um, the thing that separates a liberal from a violent revolutionary is, of course, that n- not just that their methods are different, but their goals are very different. And that's something that we're actually going to discuss pretty heavily. So I, I guess now is, is just about as good as time as any to uh, go right into it. You ready? I have never been more ready. Great. All right. Reform or revolution by Rosa Luxemburg is like state and revolution or apply piece. So it's very difficult to discuss the arguments it makes without also discussing the ones it actively refutes. In this case, the target of Luxembourg's response, and therefore our theoretical ire, is one Eduard Bernstein, a German social democrat and big-time proponent of social reform without revolution. I specify because I get the impression that the question reform or revolution is viewed as a question with only two possible answers, exclusively reform, exclusively revolution. And while there are proponents of both of those answers, Luxembourg is actually neither. And of course, Rosa Luxemburg is a Marxist, so she believes that the internal contradictions of capitalism must inexorably lead to its collapse. She believes that capitalism will, over time, lose the ability to balance the immediate profit motive of the capitalist class with the long-term efficacy of the economic system as a whole. Uh, She believes that this will be accompanied by increased socialization of production itself, meaning effectively the increased concentration of production into fewer and fewer epicenters, and the increased class consciousness of the workers. Furthermore, these developments are the result of major historical forces and represent the natural development of the capitalist system. Reforms, therefore, are not only good, but central to the onward march of capitalist development. However, the ultimate goal of the socialist movement must be explicitly revolutionary, even if that movement fights for reform in the present moment. So, What do the disagreements between Bernstein and Luxembourg look like in detail? Let's take trade unionism as an example. Bernstein sees trade unions as capable of bringing about a fundamental shift in the mode of production through gradual change by employing the leverage the workers have over the production process. Luxembourg, however, urges us to consider what kind of changes trade unions are actually capable of affecting. Unions negotiate for increased wages and benefits and improved working conditions. They're not capable of negotiating away the fundamental exploitation inherent to the private ownership of capital, simply because that ownership is what the capitalist class is negotiating to maintain. Trade unionism is good because it improves the condition of the workers, lays the groundwork for socialism by gradually socializing capitalist production, and focuses and refines the revolutionary potential of the working class. In other words, trade unionism brings the capitalist system closer to its ultimate collapse. This is the polar opposite of the opportunist position taken by Bernstein, who argues that trade unionism ameliorates not just the conditions of the working class, but the internal contradictions of capitalism itself, bringing capitalism further from collapse and decreasing the likelihood of crises. The mistake Bernstein is making here is viewing crises as a failure of the capitalist system when, in reality, they're integral. Crises are the only way to reconcile the need to constantly increase production with the finite nature of the global market. This is why the PC term for negative shocks to the economy due to internal contradictions is market correction. And once again, the need for constant expansion is central to capitalist ownership. It's not negotiable. So you can't you know, reform it away. You can't negotiate it away. It's what the owners are negotiating in the first place to maintain. Let's take a look at another example. Bernstein argues that credit makes the capitalist system more flexible, more adaptable, more able to soften or even eliminate crises. Just as with trade unions, the opportunist believes that credit brings capitalism away from its collapse by ameliorating its internal contradictions. Luxembourg counters that credit, in fact, exacerbates these contradictions. It allows capitalists to pursue infinite growth using others' capital as well as their own. It allows for the ballooning of the size of the financial system and a near total divorce of it from the material economy. This is the tinder that economic crises arise from, and those of us living after the 2008 financial crash can see that Luxembourg was totally right on this one. Credit exacerbates the internal contradictions of capitalism. The fundamental problem at the core of the opportunist view is that 
while it recognizes that production will become increasingly socialized and that the workers will become increasingly class conscious, it does not recognize the inevitability of capitalist collapse. For this reason, the opportunist is fundamentally anti-socialist. The collapse of capitalism under the weight of its own contradictions is what makes socialism necessary in the first place. By rejecting the collapse of capitalism, what Bernstein argues for is capitalism's improvement, not its replacement. Now, you may argue that opportunists seek to eventually create a system identical to the end goal of revolutionary socialists, which would constitute a gradual replacement of capitalism with socialism, but that would be wrong. Capitalism can't be replaced through liberal democratic institutions. No matter how free and fair our elections are, the buck does not stop with us. The capitalist class engages in democracy for the same reasons it negotiates with unions, to maintain capitalist ownership. It will abandon democracy if it ceases to serve those needs. Reform and revolution are both necessary, but when you consider reform more closely, keep in mind that revolution must be the ultimate goal. So it sounds like what Bernstein is arguing is that capitalism in its current sense is okay with rules because everyone can participate. However, Rosa argues that it's not because even with things like trade unions that will create a social safety net, people who are expro expropriating labor will never let it get to the point where they are equal to their workers. Yeah, exactly. Like as long as you maintain um, that private ownership, then there's always going to be an inherent inequality between the owner and the worker that's going to result in some degree of exploitation. Um, regardless of you know, you know, you can ameliorate that exploitation as 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 Rosa Luxemburg would argue to do, but ultimately the improvement of the conditions, the lessening of that power differential doesn't make that differential go away. You can't make it go away unless you totally get rid of the thing that's causing it in the first place, which is that private ownership of capital. And you can't labor union negotiate your way out of private away from the private ownership of capital, because ultimately that's actually like what the owning class brings to the negotiating table there. You know, it's like it's it would be like the it would be like the the the, the, the capitalist class trying to negotiate the ability to work for wages away from trade unions. Like, like basically try to say, like, oh, like, well, I'm just not going to pay you guys anything and try to, like, put that on the negotiating table because at that point it's not even worth it to work for you anymore. At the same time, if, if, if you're basically saying, well, we'll work, for, we'll work at this company, but you have to give up your ownership of capital, well, it's worth it. It would it, be more worth it for the owner just to not have the company at all and to keep the capital than uh, to not own it at all. Right. right. Okay, that makes sense. So at the end, you also said um, it is in the capitalist class will abandon democracy if it ceases to serve those needs. Now, I, I'd, I'd like I'd like to hear more about that, but I don't think I don't think they'd explicitly ever say that. Correct. Well, of course. I mean, you know, um, and 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 and. You know, there are different definitions of democracy. Whether or not the system that we live in as Americans today constitutes democracy is really something that is, is more of a debate than um, <laughs> anything that could be uh, considered a, an, an unarguable fact. So it might even be better wording to say that they would abandon the pretense of democracy in order to preserve capital. And I mean, this is what you see right now, right? Um, the more extreme to the left a candidate uh, becomes popular, the the more the more a the farther to the left a candidate is as they like become popular, the more capital you will see weaponized against them, and things like funding super PACs, thing things like media outlets running negative stories, basically giving free ad space. Um, you know, none of these things are democratic in the traditional sense. You know, they're they're realities of the of the ostensibly democratic system we live in, but they aren't democratic in and of themselves. And so you'll see more of those non democratic means weaponized against a candidate that threatens the interests of the capitalist class. Interesting. I mean, at the same time, you 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 might also see a, a rise of fascism, 
um, in response to it. Uh, it, it, you know, it could go a bunch of different ways ultimately. Now, conceptually, it's possible to like elect a socialist and like have them like fully like institute socialism. It just isn't practically possible because we know that the capitalist class will react a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I think another thing is I was just like going over notes here was that mm -hmm. it seems like Bernstein believes the scale of systems of government is linear with socialism on one end and capitalism on the other end in a way um yeah 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 i see what you mean like that there is a sliding scale between capitalism and socialism and so there's a point where you can have like half capitalism, half socialism, and then 60, 40, 70, 30. And that's what he wants with his social democracy and what a lot of other people want today, which is so, sort of like a social safety net without having any actual reform, like capitalism with rules. Well, you would have reform, but you wouldn't have like a revolutionary change. Correct. Yeah, I mean, well, well that, that, that's obviously it, right, is, is the idea that um, there is this linear, that there is this linear um, path between the two of them, I like the way that you put that, and, and ultimately the changes are are in reality. At least if you are to believe Rosa Luxemburg, and honestly, I found her rather convincing, is um, the, the changes that you're trying to affect when um, changing the mode of production from a private ownership to one of worker or collective or uh, of or collective ownership. Um, I mean, those changes are not only too radical to be affected through electoral reformist measures, trade unionism, but the act of implementing them would go so far against the institutions that we use to write the laws for our society that you would need to change those institutions. And those institutions aren't changeable by the methods that we have available to us. Mm -hmm. Another thing I found interesting was that um... Bernstein seems to believe that capitalism is okay because, because of what he believes is equal opportunity, you know, because, well, oh, keep going. No worries. Um, when workers with their own capital are able to invest, they become, you know, smaller capitalists themselves and they're coerced by the same market forces, as you previously said, to act, uh, and then conditions will, will li likely improve, which is why he sees it as a positive. And I, I, I don't see, did Rosa refute that? Um, can, you, can you specify specifically what you're talking about? Are you talking about just the ownership of stock, or are you talking about worker co-ops? Worker co-ops. So worker, so, so worker co-ops constitute, um, in certain parlance, uh, a form of market socialism, where the workers do own their own means of production. But there are still capitalist aspects that go into it. Um, so while so 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 it's like trade unionism, you know, it ameliorates the conditions of the working class. It it it, it sharpens their revolutionary potential because it gets them more um, used to being active in that in, in that kind of like anti-capitalist way. Um, but it does not. It still retains that like market system. So, if 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 your goal is is all about exploitation of the workers, right? Then the market system is inherently exploitative because workers, instead of having a boss drive down their wages, now will 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 be commute will be conflicting directly with other co-ops and will end up driving down their own wages. Um, you know, for the same reasons why their bosses were driving down their wages in the first place to kind of um to to compete now that's not the only reason why a boss might drive down wages he's also trying to increase his own rate of profit but um remember that sometimes that 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 competition is a real thing that firms do have to compete with each other and so there are a number of reasons why um a firm might ultimately have to accept lower profit in order to compete and that would be the same thing as workers accepting lower wages who are working in a co-op in a market socialist system so it's good, but it doesn't constitute the full revolution that a Marxist like Rosa would be looking for. And keep in mind that um, she kind of got, she died back in 1919, so pretty early. 
Um, and she's kind of in hindsight come to be associated with like extreme, like very far left, like left communist kind of ideology. So this is someone who's arguably left of Vladimir Lenin. Um, so like market socialism is definitely not something that she considers to be a complete revolution. No, of course not. And even still, um, I think Bernstein first fails to recognize that socialism within capitalism is impossible, obviously, yeah. and it's not um, like like something that could be worked towards while a capitalist system exists. It can only be it can only come to light after the previous capitalist system has complete, been completely demolished. I'm curious uh, to hear your opinion about the idea that the like collapse of the capitalist system is inevitable. Because this is, of course, one of the... This is probably the most important um, disagreement between Bernstein and Luxembourg through this, um, through this debate, is this idea of is the collapse of capitalism inevitable or would the improvement of the capitalist system actually allow it to exist longer and, and, and not, not only allow it to become more persistent and exist longer, but to make it better in the ways that really matter in the ways that matter to, to the workers and to socialists and to reduce the likelihood and the extremity of crises. Cause right now it certainly doesn't feel like that's the case to me. It feels like things are kind of, worse over time and especially when we look at the um internal contradictions of the system i mean 2008 was this we really i think internalized that end of history like francis fukuyama kind of ideology about neoliberalism and i think 2008 kind of in in the in one sense proved that the internal contradictions of capitalism were still there, that crises were still possible, and that and that um, the ballooning of the financial system was creating a an unstable situation that required market corrections, which resulted in people losing their houses, their livelihoods, and, and, and their lives often. Um, but at the same time, the response in the following years have kind of made us, made, have made me feel like the alternatives are not possible, not in the sense that they're internally inconsistent and that they wouldn't work internally, but that it is impossible to bring them about because of how much resistance is baked into the system already. I wouldn't say resistance um, necessarily, just a desire to maintain some sort of normalcy, you know? It's, but what's the difference between that and resistance, you know? I... That's, that's, if I'm understanding, if I'm understanding your point correctly, I think that's why a lot of um, people who are further left than neoliberal, hate neoliberals, have, are, are more aggressive towards neoliberals than even conservatives, I feel like, because you're, you're, you're like on, they're like on the same Certainly s- during this primary cycle, it's appeared that way. Yeah. Oh, oh, of course. If you stepped foot into lefty Twitter for five minutes, you'll know that, God, it's like, it's, it's, at least in terms of like, um, jokes and digs and online bullying made, it's 100% directed more towards, um, non-progressive candidates like my man, Bo Jiden. Um, well, you know, you know, I, I think the big difference is that I think there's two big differences. I, I think that, I think that for a lot of kind of lefties, conservatives have come to be considered something of a fact of nature, like a force of nature, something that you accept you're going to have to deal with. I think also that conservatives kind of are upfront about not sharing political goals with you. And so I think that revolutionary potential is easier to kind of come to, easier to sharpen when you understand that your political opponents are people who, you know, aren't people who disagree on um what methods they uh want to use to reach the end goal they actually have a fundamentally different end goal and of of course you know any conservative will tell you that they want the best life for the most people i mean you know not everyone but but fundamentally we understand that conservatism is a hierarchical uh ideology 
and that they fundamentally believe that some people are better than others, that those people deserve more political power, that they deserve more material wealth. And that's just not fundamentally what I believe. But when you look at um, liberals of all kind of shapes and sizes, that enlightenment refrain that all people are created equal, that they that they support human rights, that they support economic opportunity, is something that I agree with in concept. I I I do, I do like all of those things. I do want to believe in all of those things. But what you find is that there's this inconsistency with with the methods used to bring about. Uh, with the methods used and the stated goals. Um, and I think this really gets to the core, to what, another core difference between um, Bernstein and Luxembourg is, and, th- and this is what Luxembourg is, is talking about when she says that um, the reformist view isn't just impossible, it's actually fundamentally anti-socialist. Because ultimately, like if, if, if you aren't looking for a revolution, then you aren't actually looking to end capitalism. And capitalism is an inherently exploitative, inherently hierarchical structure. And so really, I think that's the frustration uh, that people are really feeling with that kind of like neoliberal democratic establishment viewpoint, is, is that inconsistency between the stated goal and the methods that people are actually willing to employ. and when you see um, movements for genuine economic equality, or at least move, or at least to make movements towards it, um, trounced by these people, it feels more like a betrayal, and less like 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 getting your doc. Like, it feels like your friend setting fire to your restaurant, as opposed to like a hurricane taking and coming in and and, and blowing it down. Like it would kind of feel like it, um, losing the conservative. Yeah, um, to your first point that you made a little bit ago, I don't. I think conservatives were viewed as a as a, a fact of nature, um, insofar as they could be made fun of, and that was true until 2016 when irony died. Irony died, sarcasm died. Nothing was funny anymore. And two, I know I've I've been saying that satire is dead for about a year. Now. The Onion articles have failed to make me laugh, and instead just make me sad now because they're all just true. And two, your your other point about. Um, just just um, reformist um, revolutionaries versus reformists. Um, I think most people on uh, the, the left stage that we are um, subscribe to the horseshoe theory. You know, I personally would find it easier to convert an angry conservative than uh, what is it? Um, a neoliberal who just wants to not care about politics anymore, just wants to not have to turn on CNN and actually consider that there's, you know, other people in this world that, you know, are directly, more directly affected by economic policy than they are. You know, people who, like, make a comfortable uh, upper to middle class living, who, you know, can just care about the aesthetics of politics, you know? That is a take I've heard from you before, and of course I've heard this from other people as well. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a, I think that there's some layers of complication to it because, like, um, I think we look at this differently because we come from different political backgrounds, right? Like you, I, I'm really sorry to out you like this. Don't uh, do it. But I know that you, I know that you were a libertarian when I first met you many years ago. A uh, yeah, very young, um, a very young, confused boy. It's okay. It's okay. We Disillusioned I mean, I, I, with and, conservatism, and of course. And of course, I was a I was like a a very market focused, um, privatized but regulate um, neoliberal pretty much up until the end of college, um, and and even a little bit past that. And so I I think the reason why I disagree with you on that one is not necessarily that I think it's easier to convert neoliberals than it is to convert um, like genuine conservatives. But more, I think it depends on other factors, because I, I also do believe that a lot of neoliberals are, are, are very taken with the kind of capitalist realism that we discussed back in episode, I want to say, four. And that certainly was the case with me, that, the, I, that, that I always felt those internal contradictions, and I always felt like I was compromising on my beliefs for the sake of being realist and being practical. And 
it, it, it took some time for me to to realize that other ways of thinking and other ways of being were possible. But ultimately, once I broke that barrier, it was very easy to um, kind of make that transition. And it's been really, really good ever since because I, I just get to feel a lot more. I feel like I'm saying one thing and then defending a policy that's the opposite of it all the time, which I, is what I, I did feel like I was doing a lot back when I was like, um, I wouldn't have identified as a neoliberal. I would have identified as a social democrat at the time. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it depends on other factors because there's obviously quite a few Republicans out there who are exactly as you described. Um, liberals to be people who don't want to think about these things and who want to just who just want to go to sleep um, at, you know for four years in between elections and not think about it um, and at the same time there are a lot of liberals out there who believe in the same fundamental things that socialists believe want the same fundamental goals and don't realize and, and, and simply don't realize or, or haven't had don't have the right information or you just don't think that it's possible to believe the things that socialists believe on a policy level. So I absolutely. guess if you can break that barrier, then you can you can do quite a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel like there's there's um the bell curve of distribution of political ideologies with the first and second standard deviations. So totaling sixty six percent of the political population is the disillusioned right and the disillusioned left. Who don't care plus the other uh, let's see like 16 and a half percent of the hard right who are actually politically active if all all of them are working against you totally have to say like 82 percent or so 83 percent of people working against you that can feel awful and that's why I think the you know it's it's so it's so frustrating when you see like a third of the population just like so close, just not taking that next step to realize good things are possible in the in the in favor of you know these small practical reforms, like under not not fully believing in themselves that good things are possible in favor of these small wins when conservatives keep moving goalposts back and back and back. You know, sometimes I feel like it's, at least in actual governmental bodies, it's Republicans versus moderates. Republicans say, we want this, we're not budging, and then we move towards them. And it's very frustrating. Yeah, and of course, and, and of course as, as, as the amazing guys at Citations Needed have pointed out in the past, is that you see this pattern with Democrats in government where they go, oh, we can't even try for this thing. that It wouldn't even be that radical of a reform, but it would at least genuinely help people in some way. Um, but we can't, even, we can't even put that to a vote. We can't even bring that into the House because we know Republicans would reject it. So you end up where Democrats are putting things forward, having compromised already, and you're sitting there, and quite frankly, you don't actually know what these people want. You don't know if they're bullshitting you. What if they don't actually want the things that they tell you that they want? And what if they're using this as an ex- what if they're using the Republicans as an excuse to avoid even um, to avoid even even having to entertain the possibility? That's one of the things that I find so. That's one of the reasons why I find the whole Bernie won't compromise argument to be um, so unconvincing. Because at the very least, I would like for 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 the people representing. Um, those of us who ostensibly want a better world, who want more equality, who want more opportunity for people, and ultimately who want uh, a complete overhaul from a fundamental level of the system, to at least make them say no to us, um, you know, at least make the conservatives tell us no, instead of instead of taking the no before we've even asked. Um, at the same time, I think that it's hard to call kind of poison electoral effort even if electoralism is a fuck which of course it is um but but to 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 put an electoral effort that is supposed to fight for equality um on a political foundation that refuses to fight for equality because it knows it can't get it 
Like that just doesn't work. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I was going to ask if you had any final thoughts on the idea of reform versus revolution. I could see it even in this grainy computer scene. I could see it screen. I could see it on your face. But um, yeah, no, I, I was going. I was going to relate to something else, but it's um, already more off no, topic. No, no, go ahead. Keep more going. More topic than we already are. But I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess, just just like jumping off your point, I, I would, I would say it's very much um, seen in uh, Obama's candidacy. At least, at least from what I've read, um, all all cards on the table. I was eleven during the two thousand eight election, but how dare I, you? I, I apologize. I apologize. From an eleven year old to a twelve year old, I apologize. Um, he ran a very grassroots campaign with a lot of big ideas to enact actual change. But when he got actually got into office, he it was a one man race to the middle. He tried to be like the compromise candidate, the moderate candidate, but ended up sending just as many drones and bombs into the Middle East as, you know, actually, is it, it's getting up there, but I'm not sure if it's more than Trump has sent, but it's, um, it's certainly not a small amount. Um, it, 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 who, who is the winner of the race, uh, depends on what metric you're using, whether you're using something like total number of strikes. Um, or like number of like civilian casualties, stuff like AA, depending on the numbers you use. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I'll put sure. Them in but my main point is that it was light imperialism, and you know, CN not CNN, Fox News branded him a communist for it, a fucking communist. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, I still see. I I, I saw Michael Bloomberg branded branded a communist, which is of course the most laughable thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, you know, during like the times where he was still politically relevant as a uh, personal personal figure. Pete Buttigieg feels like a, a ghost of the past now. It's I, it, it's weird to even remember that he was a political candidate, even though he dropped out what, was like a month ago. It was exactly four weeks. Holy ago. shit! I'm a genius. Yeah, can you fucking Time believe? Time-keeping God. I. So you know who we're going to be seeing more of is. Him and Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang's already been a CNN staffer and already yeah, has some yeah, they're never going away. awful takes and potentially out of Joe Biden as an absolute criminal. We're probably going to see another presidential campaign by Elizabeth Warren. Um, Isn't she 72? That wouldn't be surprised. She's 72. Well, Bernie was 78, and so and Joe Biden's already Yeah, 70. she has two more in um, her. Bloomberg is 78. I just don't give a shit how old Trump is. He's in his 70s. I know, but he looks so young. Do you see that? Do you see that tan skin? He's beautiful. All that vitamin this is D. This deliberate podcast. We're not just going to take cheap shots at Trump. <laughs> All right. Any final um, thoughts before we hop off? You know, I I think we've said just about everything that needs saying, and quite a bit more. Um, you know, these are kind of scary times. We don't really know what's going to happen but some one thing that gives me hope is that as we see more and more kind of elite bourgeois figures um at this point in time attempting to suggest the economy is worth more than the lives of the people who live in it the more hope i get because it, it doesn't seem like that message is resonating for most people at all. And and I, I do see a potential for an awakening of something. Is it class consciousness? Is it something akin to it that isn't quite the same thing? Um, you know, it, that all remains to be seen. But... Um, I have the answer for you, Mark, and it's leftism on TikTok. But for right now, all we can do is, you know, grab some Gogurt and Doritos, hunker down with a good book, and... Uh, down some mango white claws, as I am doing as we speak. I thought it was watermelon. Yeah, I mean, it was actually... I had a mango before. This is a watermelon. Oh, my God. Thank God you're not truly, man. This is a, this is a purely white claw podcast. We don't do brand loyalty. I don't do that. Not even to Genesee? Not even to Genesee. <laughs>
Gen- we um, we are we are loyal to Genesee Brewery or whatever beer is cheapest at your local grocery store. All right, listen, all you all you're great. I love you all so much. Um, please, please, please stay safe. Stay inside. And yes, yeah, stay inside if you can. I understand that it's hard for some for for a lot of us. I understand that um, a lot of us got to go outside to, you know, just like stay alive. Um, but please, please, please stay as safe as you possibly can. Um, you know, if and 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 please, you know, maintain social connections. Reach out to us. We have our Twitter at We Read Theory Pod. You know. We don't have too too many people listening just yet, so uh, you know, start some discourse with us. Hit, you know, you're gonna you can hit Alex up on the Twitter. Give me your hot takes. Um, I want all of them. And, and yeah, um, I don't know. That's all I gotta say. Um, listen, like like I said, we don't have too too many people listening right now. So if there's anything that you particularly want to hear about, um, hit us up. Let us know. We have a we have a backlog of things that we are looking to do episodes on. There's a good chance that if you're particularly interested in something, it's already on our backlog. So um, if you if you tell us you'd like to hear it, then we might expedite it. Um, that's basically it. Um, in the future, the episodes that you can expect coming up next should be a bonus episode for manufacturing consent. Um, where we dis- where I uh, discuss the KGB Bulgarian plot to assassinate Pope John Paul II, and um, kind of the media coverage surrounding that, as well as uh, we're going to dive into some Marx. We're going to talk about the critique of the Gotha program, and um, you know really get a strong foundation for what uh, Marxism is, because we've talked a lot about that word, and uh, I think it's about time that we really explored what it means to be a Marxist, because, of course, that is uh, central to so many of the work we've been reading so far. Yeah. That, and if you are a healthcare worker or forced to work at all during these times, you know, tweet at me. Um, I want to buy I want to buy some you beers or something, because that's that's all that's holding us together right now is nurses and seamless. Uh, We support the troops. Do you? Oh, fuck yeah, dude. All right. All right. Signing off. Love you guys.